following program on Ave Verna 24 is classified for general audience. It is intended for all ages. It contains little or no violence, no strong language, and little or no sexual dialogue or situations. Tonight, we discuss the functions and powers of trade unions in Sri Lanka. With the economic crisis causing unrest within the country, trade union-led actions such as worker strikes have come to be increasing in number. What are the provisions that allow for the creation and functioning of trade unions? What powers and authority has been bestowed on trade unions by the legal system? How has the regulation of termination of employment evolved in response to recent events? A very good evening to everyone joining us on Law, Land and Liberty where we bring to you the legal aspect of current events and breaking it down the salient features for the layman. Now trade unions are a topic that appears often when relating to recent events in Sri Lanka with the announcement of multiple strikes across industries but it is still unclear to most of us exactly what a trade union is and who belongs to these unions and also how these unions are being held accountable. Now to talk about this topic we have with us attorney at law Manoli Jinadasa who is a senior lawyer with 28 years of experience in this field. Thank you very much, ma'am, for joining us on this program today to speak to us. Now, of course, before we get into this topic, as always, there is the breakdown of the discussion for tonight. First, we'll be talking about trade unions, its formation and function, as well as who belongs in such a union. Next, we have trade union actions, such as strikes, and who is held accountable, the legality of such strikes. And finally, we'll be talking about termination and what exactly has changed when taking into consideration the new amendments. Hello, my name is Sudhila Amritunga and I'm a mechatronics engineering graduate. My question is on provisions. What is a trade union and what legislature governs it? All right, without any further ado, let's get right into the discussion. Thank you once again, ma'am, for taking the time to speak to us and enlighten the layman regarding the trade union rights and the trade union, essentially. So without uh, much further ado, let's get really into the topic. Let's uh, get an explanation because I don't think a lot of us watching have that uh, knowledge. What exactly is a trade union and what legislature in Sri Lankan law uh, governs such uh, formations of trade unions? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Anuradhi, for inviting me for this program. Uh, you asked a very interesting question. The concept of tr a trade union was birthed not in Sri Lanka, but in England, as you all know. It was in the latter part of the 17th century where industrialization took place in England with the discovery of iron and coal. Uh, prior to that, in the pre-industrial uh, era, every workman had his own little workshop who used to produce things and sell to the market. Then with the industrialization, uh, there was a concept where the capital was put by one party and the labor was put by the other. So there were two parties to, the, to, to a trade. And as a result of it, the, those who put the capital were very profit driven because they had to sell their goods in a competitive market. The laborers on the other hand had nothing to uh, offer but their labor. So there was a lot of exploitation where the sanitization was poor, there was overcrowding, underpay and even corporal punishment to increase the production. So in that kind of environment, they are the, it gave birth to the concept of united we stand, divided we fall. That's where that uh, saying came and people like Karl Marx encouraged it. In fact, there is a wonderful saying by Karl Marx, I may I just quote it for the audience. Workers of the world unite. There is nothing to lose other than the fetters in your hand. There is a world to win. So that kind of encouragement really uh, sort of gave uh, power to the workers' uh, unions. And in England, uh, by if I'm not mistaken, by 1796, yeah, 1799, the act, uh, act came through Parliament called the Combination Act, which actually suppressed 
trade union activity. The act was very specific. It suppressed worker congregation and trade union activity. But that act had to be repealed by 1824 due to the worker movement. So that is the birth of the trade unions in this country. And it was birth to protect worker rights. But of course, by now, the whole concept of trade unionism has changed and has evolved. In fact, it evolved in 1935 when the act, the trade union ordinance came into being in 1935, it expanded the scope to include even employers, whereas it was originally intended to protect worker rights. I see. So that is the historical aspect of exactly yes. how trade union came yes. to be. And now here we are in the future with trade unions and of course the current situation that Sri Lanka is in. Uh, actually, we'll go right into that. Uh, Ma'am, could you please explain to us exactly what legislature is there in, in the current context in Sri Lanka that govern trade unions? Yes, you get the trade union ordinance and you get the Industrial Disputes Act. Trade Union Ordinance is as old as 1935. It came into being in 1935. But what happened there was it provided for the registration of the union, but it did not provide for the recognition of a trade union. So the employers, although registration was mandatory, could ignore a trade union. So there was a problem there and that was rectified by provisions of the Industrial Disputes Act which brought in legislation where it was mandatory for the employer to recognize uh, the collective bargaining power of a union if the union enjoyed 40% of the member representation of that particular trade that they were representing. I see. So that means there is a specific democratic process that goes about and that is how uh, trade unions are given their say in the current context as well. Yes. Now that is worker trade unions. But one thing that you must, I must emphasize on is you even get employer trade unions. The oldest employer trade union in this country is the Employers Federation. So that's why I said the whole concept of trade unions changed quite a bit where originally it was for the workers but now you get a trade union for the employers as well to include in the to, so that they can uh, bargain better in the collective bargaining I see. Process. So now just to actually uh, uh, latch on to that, now the employers trade unions, there's a workers trade union, so trade unionism has definitely changed over the years. But has the formation of a trade union really changed over the years? What is that like? No, no. The trade unions ordinance has very specific provisions for the formation of the trade union. That is, I believe, section 9. Uh, yes. Uh, in section 9, there's a prescribed form. It has a minimum number of um, uh, members, that is seven members. You must have seven members and you must register with the Registrar of Trade Unions. And there are certain documentation that you need to sub sub uh, submit to the Registrar, like such as the rules of the trade union and also information about the members, information about the officials and uh, the address and the name of the trade union and the Registrar will consider all that. And there are certain instances where the name has to be changed if there are two names which are similar. And there are certain instances where if the objectives of the trade union uh, are dubious the registrar has the power to even refuse registration I see so the registrar refusing registration that is the first sort of a uh, selection process that trade unions yes. go through of course that is an appealable decision one can go to the district court and get the decision reversed also. I see so following the registrar uh, is there a legal procedure like contesting in court or uh, yes the trade union ordinance has specific provisions where you can apply to the district district court to contest the uh, decision of the registry. I see. Now let's get on to the next biggest question. Now we know what a trade union is and where it gets its powers from. Who can exactly join a trade union, ma'am? Now we say that, you know, of course in general employers and workers both have trade unions, but how do you qualify for joining a trade union? 
any person can join a trade union because it is a right which is guaranteed by the constitution. It is a fundamental right. So any person can join and apart from that the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in section 23.4 also has recognized the right to join a trade union. Apart from that the ILO, the International Labour Organization uh, has in I think Clause 87 and also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, ILO 98 or in 1949, both recognize the freedom of association and the uh, labor, uh, uh, the right of the labor to join an association. I see. Then, um, so now we know that anyone essentially can join a trade union, be it uh, yes. an employer or an employee. Yes. It, uh, can I elaborate a little more on yes, that? Yes, please. Uh, now, within an organization, sometimes often the question arises whether the management level or the executives can join a trade union. I'm constantly asked that question by a lot of employers. Okay, I have gone from being a clerk to a, uh, sorry, my my uh, worker has gone from a clerk to an executive position. Now, can I make him not be in the trade union? No, that is not possible. In fact, there was a case uh, called Gunaratna versus People's Bank, if I'm not mistaken, where very clearly the Supreme Court held that every person has a right to join the trade union. And just because you uh, enter the managerial grade or the executive grade, that right cannot be taken away. I see. So there is still you still belong inside a trade union as long as uh, you Re the required uh, criteria yes. are met. But there is a category of employees in the public sector who cannot join trade unions, like the judicial officers, the members of the armed forces, the members of the police phone, force, and also the members of the, I think, the prisons officers. They cannot join a trade union that is by law prevented because the trade union ordinance has specific provisions uh, preventing them from joining trade unions. I see. So there is still a sect that yes. has to yes. be... Uh, and at the, the time the trade union ordinance came in, the agricultural corps was in existence and they prevented the agricultural corps also from joining uh, uh, or forming a trade union. Okay, so that means, so there are specific instances. There are specific, but that is highly contested because uh, here we have the ILO specifically stating, and this is a very interesting uh, quotation, freedom of association and protection of the right to organize. The ILO convention says, workers without distinction whatsoever shall have the right to establish and subject only to the rules of the organization concerned to join organizations of their own choosing without previous authorization. So that is a universal right and we have ratified this. So therefore the question arises whether it is possible to deprive any particular seg segment of even the public service from uh, not forming a trade union or preventing them from sorry, preventing them from forming a trade union. So that is a question which is in debate and some authors feel that uh, those are fetters imposed by the government on their own employees. But uh, to date, generally, uh, the armed forces cannot have trade union. I see. So now we know exactly who can and who cannot be part of a trade union. Uh, the next big question is, what does a trade union essentially do, ma'am? What are the functions as governed by legislature? What are the powers that have been granted to the trade union? And what does a trade union exactly do for itself? Okay, so we'll start with section two of the trade union ordinance, which gives the objectives of a trade union. Of course, these objectives have evolved with time, but I will first get on to section two because I would like to quote from the act itself so that I'm absolutely accurate on on the subject, okay. uh, section two of the trade union ordinance says, trade union means any association or combination of workmen or employees, whether temporary or permanent, having among, it, among its objects one or more of the following objects. Now the first one is the regulation of relations between workmen and employers, or between workmen and workmen, or between employers and employers. Number two, the imposing of restrictive conditions on the conduct of any uh, trade or business. Uh, 
Number three, the representation of either workmen or employers in trade disputes. And number four, the promotion or organization or financing of strikes or lock lockouts in any trade or industry or the provision of, of pay or other benefits for its members during a strike or lockout and includes any federation of two or more trade unions. Now, when one looks at this, there is nothing about politics in this. But of course, the trade union ordinance provides for a separate political fund and the purpose of the fund appears to be to fund members of parliament and so on, which we presume in furtherance of these objectives. So, trade union objectives originally were worker related, but now the political uh, aspect also has come in and it, uh, it tends to promote political views as well through these objectives. I see. So, the political aspect of it, ma'am, uh, does that in any way negate the protection and, you know, the sort of services that a trade union has and is held accountable for by its members? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because certain trade union rights and worker rights need to be promoted even in parliament. So it's important for a trade union to have their sympathizers, to have representation in parliament because most of the worker rights come through the legislation of this country and the legislation is made in parliament. So therefore it doesn't really negate but unfortunately today we find more and more uh, political views colouring the actual objectives of the trade union which is uh, promoting and which is uh, protecting worker rights. I see. So while there is a tinge of that issue, uh, the original objective still remains the same as mentioned in the legislature. Well, there is a lot more for us to discuss and break down, especially regarding the actions that trade unions can take such as uh, strikes uh, and of course accountability uh, when it comes to such strikes and the legality of the issue. But before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Lawland and Liberty. Stay with us. Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in discussion about trade union rights and trade unions in general with attorney at law, Manal Jinadasa. Thank you very much once again, ma'am, for the earlier dis explanations and clarifying for our viewers exactly what a trade union is and how a trade union functions. So let's get right into the issue at hand, basically strikes that are uh, organized and carried out by trade unions. Now, a lot of people have a lot of, there's a lot of ambiguity when it comes to the whole strike situation because it has in, on certain occasions caused a little bit of disruption for the general public. So there's really not much knowledge uh, regarding exactly how a strike is carried out and the legal process behind it. So could you please let us know, ma'am, how does the law govern strike action by unions? Okay. Uh, strike is a legitimate weapon a trade union has. There is no doubt about it as much as a lockout for the employer. So you get strike action for the employee and lockouts for the employer. That is how it goes. And the legitimacy of the strikes have been uh, recognized and upheld by a number of uh, judgments in the Supreme Court. And uh, only problem is, Anuradhi, I find that in time, the nature of the strikes have changed. For example, if we take, uh, there is a sick note campaign, which is very popular in Sri Lanka right now. So that is a form of strike that they have resorted to. They present a false sick note and they do not work. Now, the morality of that kind of strike has come into issue and is the subject matter of discussion because uh, especially for professions such as we'll say the medical profession or the teaching profession, what we are doing is presenting a note which is false because you are not sick and you're staying away from work. 
Now, while striking in the legitimate form is okay, uh, it is the view even of the Supreme Court, there are judgments to the effect that sick notes of uh, submitting false uh, medical certificates is not an acceptable form of a strike. I would like to quote a particular judgment because it is so interesting. Uh, where Justice Sharvananda, this was some time ago, uh, very clearly held thus where uh, uh, terminations occurred for submitting false medical certificates and going on sick note uh, campaigns. Uh, the case was Bandara versus Ministry of Lands and sorry it was Justice Mark Fernando if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he said learned president counsel for the petitioners contended with little enthusiasm that submitting false sick notes and medical certificates was a legitimate trade union action as part of a work to rule campaign. I have equally little hesitation in rejecting that contention. The court will not condone the conduct of an employee who lies or otherwise deceives his employer as to the reason for his failure to work, whether individually or collectively. That it was a trade union action aggravates rather than mitigates such misconduct. An employer would be justified in taking disciplinary action in respect of such misconduct. I think that says it all, the way the courts have viewed uh, the sick note campaigns and morally, just imagine Anuradhi, when the teachers submit false medical certificates, sometimes in schools, if a child gets absent, we want the parents to confirm whether the child is sick or not. And a punishment is given if the child has falsely said he was sick. How can a teacher impose such a punishment on a student when she or he himself has given a false medical certificate very openly and publicly and indulge in trade union action? So that form of trade union action is completely unacceptable. And apart from strikes, I think go slow is also another form of trade union action where the uh, courts have time and again said it is not a fair practice because the employer is paying, you are engaged in work, but you are deliberately uh, reducing the output. So things like that have been held as illegal uh, by courts of law. And in fact, I remember the Joint Apparel Union filed a fundamental rights action against the trade union for bringing down the product, uh, the output of the port by 60%. And the court held in, the, uh, in their favor and held that the Joint Apparel Association was correct in uh, coming before courts uh, for, for uh, the go slow campaign. So work to rule, however, is a legitimate uh, form of trade union action. So now, ma'am, building on the uh, legality of a strike and strikes in general on the trade union, uh, there has been a lot of uh, say in the public forum regarding filing fundamental rights petitions, regarding uh, trade union strike actions and uh, the prevention of such or the suppression as they call it. Uh, could you please clarify to us, ma'am, uh, the standing between fundamental rights and also strike action under trade unions, how that relates? Yes. Uh, there is a very interesting case, Yasapala versus Ranil Vikramasinghe. Uh, in that case, uh, the question of whether the right to strike of a person came into uh, uh, focus. And there are Sharvananda, Ju Justice uh, Sharvananda held that one cannot invoke fundamental rights for strikes. Yes, one can invoke fundamental rights if you are prevented from joining a trade union but not for strikes. What he, he made a very interesting observation. He said if fundamental rights for strikes are allowed, then fundamental rights should also apply for lockouts, which is the employer's right. So he said for strikes, there is no fundamental rights and the application was dismissed. So taking on that, I would also like to uh, uh, talk about the status of trade unions in fundamental rights application. The, in the case of Ceylon Electricity Board trade union versus the Patali Champaka Ranavaka case, the Supreme Court very clearly held that the trade union can't file a fundamental rights application on behalf of a member. Then even before that, in the district court, 
there was a case of CMC versus Sri Lanka Insurance Corporation, where the district court rejected the trade union standing in a matter concerning contracts, a breach of contract, and that was upheld by the Supreme Court. So the only forum where the members are uh, represented by the trade unions are the industrial forums, such as the labor tribunals, the arbitrations, where the Industrial Disputes Act has given them the local standi to appear on behalf of their, uh, appear and represent their members but so, not for fundamental rights. I see, so it's not, we can't basically, apart from uh, the industrial specific mentions, uh, areas that Ma'am mentioned. So then does that mean that employer unions function differently, Ma'am? You mentioned there were two uh, kinds of unions. So when it comes to filing fundamental rights and the representation of these members in court, through fundamental rights. Is that different when it comes to employer unions? No, I don't think there is a difference uh, where the Joint Apparel Association was. That was an association. And they, uh, several number of uh, members filed that action. So uh, here we are talking about trade unions. And where trade unions are concerned, no trade union will be allowed to represent a member for a fundamental rights case or even uh, for a breach of contract in the district court. So apart from uh, striking and the other methods that Ma'am mentioned earlier on, uh, uh, in what ways, in what other ways do unions hold employers accountable in a sense? As in, apart from the striking, there must be other ways in which a union has power over uh, certain actions that uh, the employer takes part in. Yes, actually strike should be the last resort. And it is always recommended that the strike is a last resort. So when the, the strongest weapon the trade union has is the collective bargaining process. And I don't know why, but I find that some employers are reluctant to enter into collective agreements. Uh, but I find that collective agreements regularize the relationship between the employer and the employee and should be encouraged. So there are the unions, because of their strength in the membership, have a lot of bargaining power where they can push for a lot of benefits for the workers. And the employer, in turn, uh, to prevent, for example, if a strike occurs, if there's a procedure for strike, if there is first under the collective agreement a sort of a discussion that has to take place, and most often Often we have provisions such as if we can't agree on a point, we will involve the Commissioner of Labor who will arbiter in between the employer and the employee. So a uh, lot of provisions like that are generally included in collective agreements which give a step-by-step -step guideline on how to resolve a dispute. And strike action is the last resort and even then proper notice is given of a strike action so that the employer can minimize his losses because the end goal is not to shut down a company. The end goal is to get one's demand but the organization also must exist because if the organization doesn't exist, one can't get one's demand. One is ultimately at home without a job because if the industry collapses, there is no employment. So in the old days, there were trade union leaders such as I remember late Mr. Balatampo and all who were well versed. They looked at the bigger picture. They looked at the employer's standing and the employee's protection and they balanced it. I find today also, there are certain trade unions who look at the bigger picture, but there are certain trade unions which resort to try strike action as the first step. So things like collective bargaining prevents that and should be in fact encouraged. And in the collective bargaining process, the trade unions have a very big weapon because they can, uh, for example, a work to rule campaign can cause immense amount of difficulty for the employer. So uh, by, by resorting to actions such as that, through hard negotiations, they can win their demands and they have most often because no employer wants a breakdown in the production. So they do, they, they in most often than not, I find that the employer being very amenable and very open to discussion, but there is a reluctance in Sri Lanka, I don't know why, for the, to enter into collective agreements, which I often uh, encourage because it streamlines the relationship between the employer and the employee. 
Mm. So, so that yeah. is one strong uh, weapon the trade unions also have to collectively bargain and get your rights in writing and ensure the employer uh, sticks to it. Otherwise, of course, one can have work to rule. One can strike. Strike is a very legitimate uh, weapon which is recognized by law as much as a lockout. Uh, and there are trade union actions of such like which they can resort to in a legitimate way. But there are illegal strikes. Section 40 of the Industrial Disputes Act very clearly has defined what illegal strikes are. For example, if an issue has been resolved by an arbitration or there's a labor tribunal order, then one cannot on the same issue strike. That will cause an illegal strike. Sometimes when a matter has been referred for arbitration, you can't resort to a strike action in respect of the same matter. Likewise, if there's a collective agreement, one cannot resort to strike action on the issues covered by the collective agreement without following the formula set out in the collective agreement. So those will be illegal strikes. And there are other forms of illegal strikes where the court will determine whether a strike is legal or not, when there is violence, when there is, uh, uh, when they set fire to factories. So those are individual. What is legal and illegal is generally determined by court on a reasonable basis. I see. So there is a discretion for the court. Yes, in, in, in certain instances, but there are specific instances under Section 40 of the Industrial Disputes Act, which uh, has held, which has defined what a legal strike is. I see. Then building on that uh, exactly, ma'am, now we know that the strike action is a perfectly legitimate method of expressing uh, through trade unions uh, for workers' rights. But is there no legislative uh, clause that mentions that the strike action should be a last resort? Is there no hierarchy of a sort or a process for trade unions to go through in order to re resort to a sort? Well, a lot of authors of industrial law generally says that strike should be the last resort, but there is no legislation uh, to that effect uh, in Sri Lanka, definitely, that the strike should be the last resort. But uh, having said that, I think it's common sense as well because when you are striking in a manner which is illegal or unlawful, you are actually cutting your own uh, grave because if the industry collapses, then where are you going to get your demands? <laughs> and how are you going to get your demands? Yes, exactly. So, there is no industry, then there, there are mouths to feed, yes. but there is no... And also there is one very important aspect that we have to consider. Although the constitution recognizes the right to join a trade union, uh, Article 157 of the Constitution also says that in the exercise of fundamental rights, uh, one cannot act in violation of public policy, nor can one, I would like to quote that very section, which is uh, relevant, I want to get the words right, I think I have the Constitution with me, Article 157, it says the exercise and operation of all fundamental rights declared and recognized by Articles 12, 13, 1, 13, 2 and 14 shall be subject to such restrictions as may be prescribed by law in the interest of national security, public order and the protection of public health or morality or for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect for the rights and freedoms of others. So if you strike in a manner which causes uh, or which violates the rights and freedoms of others, then that is not a legitimate strike and nor is it up, will be upheld by the uh, courts of law. So 157 is something that we have to be mindful of. But having said that, I must say 157 exempts one clause. It says uh, 12, 13, 1 and 13, 2 and 14, but the fundamental right guaranteed by Article 11, which is torture, is exempted. So on no account can you torture a person uh, in the guise of, uh, like torture does not uh, is not covered by 157.
Mm. So there are, there is a, a sort of safety net when it comes yes. to uh, actually... Yes. Nobody can torture yes, another of person course, in uh, the guise of protecting another person's fundamental rights. Yes, right. exactly. So that means there is, when it comes to trade unions also, there is a restriction because a lot of people believe that trade unions feel like a be-all, end-all, like a powerful weapon that nobody can stand against because it is a collective uh, uh, union. Uh, but there are restrictions, there are... Uh, there are, and in other aspects, as well because under the trade union ordinance there are a lot of rights given to the trade unions because in furtherance or pursuance of their objectives they can do anything and you can't file action against them not even for tortious liability so uh, sometimes trade unions tend to blatantly uh, defame other people and uh, talk of things which are not in pursuance of their objectives in the guise of being a trade union official or in the guise of trade union action. Now that should not be allowed because although they have under the trade union ordinance these rights that they, are, they have immunity where people can't file action when they pursue trade union action, uh, one must remember that to conduct oneself in a manner uh, that is for the furtherance of the objective, but not to defame other people or cause mischief or engage in illegal activity in the guise of trade union action. I see. There's a lot more to unpack uh, when it comes to uh, trade unions. And of course, we have to get a little bit into the termination aspect as well, because that also falls under workers' rights. So before that, let's take a very short commercial break. You're watching Law, Land and Liberty. Stay with us. My question is on termination. What changes have been brought about by the amendments made to the employment termination laws? Welcome back to Law, Land and Liberty. We were in discussion about trade unions and of course uh, the repercussions of strikes and that's what exactly what we were talking about. But this is the last segment, ma'am. Uh, so I'd really like to direct your attention to the termination of employment, which is a very heavy packed topic, uh, which is why we have it for last, so we can spend a little bit more time on it. Ma'am, what legislature essentially governs a termination of employment? Well, there are two aspects. You get the disciplinary termination and the non-disciplinary termination. Now, if it is a disciplinary termination, you uh, terminate a person on disciplinary grounds, then that person has the option of going before the labor tribunal within six months or even making a complaint to the Labor Department and if the matter cannot be resolved, sometimes they uh, refer it for arbitration. But most of the time, the Labor Department also says, go file a Labor Tribunal application. So that is the quickest and the best remedy uh, for a workman. Where non-discipline termination is concerned, now, especially in this environment, one finds that a lot of companies tend to wind up. They tend to downsize. So then the company itself has the provision under the termination of employment law to make an application to the Commission of Labor and seek permission to terminate an employee. Sometimes, of course, if both the employee and the employer agrees to a, maybe a compensation package, one can do it privately without permission of the Commission of Labor. But if the employee refuses and the employer cannot go on, then one has to make an application under the termination of employment law. Now, sometimes employers just terminate people, which is non-disciplinary, but do not make an application. Then the employee has the right to go before the termination of employment unit and make a complaint under the termination of employment law. Now, a lot of people I find are sometimes reluctant to uh, uh, resort to this because of the time it consumes. But I must say, post-COVID, especially where the employers are concerned, the, the Labor Department has now 
put in place a mechanism where one need not have a very long inquiry. One can give all of the evidence to support or justify the closure of a plant by presenting evidence through an affidavit and annex documents, uh, which, which has made the process much quicker. But if the workman complains, then of course it becomes a situation where I, I witness accounts and sometimes evidence is necessary. It is only then that they will have a inquiry and uh, the the very recently they also increase the amounts because under the termination unit act there is a ceiling on the compensation that can be awarded and that is now 2.5 million uh, so up to 2.5 million depending on your service period the workman is entitled now the latest legislation i'm sure you would like to talk about the latest legislation um, there is an aspect which really helps the workmen because one big problem we had both under the industrial disputes act and the termination unit was when you win a case when the workman wins a case and gets an amount the employer appeals now under the industrial disputes act one has to deposit the security as security the amount that had been awarded to the workman but under the termination of employment act if you're appealing or if you take a writ to quash the decision of the commission of labor granting uh, compensation uh, such a deposit was not required. Even under the EPF Act, ETF Act, such deposits were not required. Sometimes you, the employer appeals and no deposit is put in place. So that was rectified by, uh, in 2022, Act number 22, 23, 24, under the Termination and the Industrial Disputes Act. Uh, they brought in uh, legislation where the employer now has to place a security deposit even to challenge an order of the Commissioner of Labor under the Termination of Employment Act. Likewise, in the, say in the Labor Tribunal, the employer wins, so security is not necessary. Then you appeal to the High Court and the employee wins. Then the employer has another opportunity to appeal to the Supreme Court. In order to appeal to the Supreme Court, now the employer has to once again deposit the money. Now that is very important because sometimes these cases take some time and in the meantime the employer can go bankrupt. They can close, they can shift the money. So to prevent that, the legislature has introduced these provisions where the employer has to place that security deposit. So that is a very important piece of legislation that came in 2022, which will help the workmen in a big way. So uh, there has been amendments in that sort to hold employers more accountable yes. for the actions of termination. Yes. Now, now that we know that there is a drastic uh, increase of, you know, re reliability, I guess, on the uh, act in itself, Ma'am, are there areas of the amendment that has uh, worked in favour of employers apart from... Uh Actually, for the employer, this particular provision that I in fact cited can have adverse consequences. Now, if you take a, a small, uh, in the sense, a small business, they may not have the money to deposit. And sometimes these awards can be not under the Termination of Employment Act, but sometimes even under the Industrial Disputes Act. It can be a very large uh, amount of compensation because there's no ceiling under the Industrial Disputes Act, especially before the labor tribunals. So if the order is in fact wrong, completely unjustified. For you to appeal, you need that amount of money to be deposited. So that becomes a huge problem because sometimes a number of workers have got together, it's a joint application, and the amount of money to be deposited is enormous. So there, are, there is a big lacuna in the law, the law which is very unfavorable to the small time employee, like small and medium enterprises will suffer as a consequence of this law, especially when it comes to EPF, ETF, because on and off, not always, but on and off, EPF, ETF certificates are issued sometimes without even a proper inquiry. So in such instances, there have been many occasions where the employer has had to, uh, is actually uh, held responsible for people who are independent contractors, who have not really worked for them, but for another company, but mistaken identity. Now, though that kind of situation, it is very unfair on the employer to deposit a huge sum. 
as a liability and then that sum gets collected. I mean, you know, it's deposited and then it takes years for the case to end. And then uh, there's a lot of financial difficulties to companies as a result of it. And in general, labor legislation, I must say, uh, is very favorable to the employee and not so much to the employer because always uh, one looks at things with justice and equity and sometimes although there are provisions in the contract of employment where one can give notice and terminate the courts don't uphold those uh, provisions on the premise that the employee is in unequal bargaining position at the time of recruitment. Now, that may be true where uh, minor positions are concerned, but sometimes where uh, very responsible positions are concerned, it is the employee who bargains with the employer because they are so highly sought after, especially in the technical side. And then they come agreeing to certain conditions, for example, allowances. They say, give me a reimbursable allowance. You don't have to pay EPF, ETF on it. They actually sign to that effect. And then after the termination or after their employment end, they say they were in unequal bargaining position and they claim EPF, ETF also for that reimbursable allowance, which doesn't get covered under the Act. So there are situations like that. This unequal bargaining power uh, concept, I feel, is no longer justified, but the Labor Department is always mindful and they abide strictly by that concept. And uh, con conditions of contract are important in a in a district court, but not in the labor forum. Labor <laughs> forum, yes, exactly. I mean, it has to deal with, uh, yeah. of course, the essential rights of uh, someone that is uh, working under someone and someone that is working for someone. So and there is a give and take when it comes to that. Um, and I'm speaking of terminations, because you asked about the larger picture, most letters of the appointment has a termination clause. But that clause is not upheld in labor law because I get a lot of, often I get employers coming to me and saying there is a clause, both parties have agreed, why can't we enforce this clause? But then the, under the industrial law, one looks at the just and equity of it, and that uh, provision is completely ignored. <laughs> I see. So there has to be an equitable uh, uh, discussion there. But uh, Yes, I think the labor laws have to go through some reforms because our labor laws, compared to most countries, are very strict, in fact, too strict. If we want to attract foreign employees, there has to be some sort of accountability and some sort of uh, formula, especially for the payment of compensation, because so that they can keep provision and they know the liability they have to face in case they want to terminate an employee. Uh, so that uncertainty has caused a lot of foreign investment uh, to rethink their position in Sri Lanka. All right. Well, unfortunately, time has come against us. Uh, that has been a very insightful discussion regarding the trade union. Uh, thank you very much once again, ma'am, for taking the time to speak to us and to enlighten our viewers on exactly how a trade union functions and the legislative uh, aspects regarding trade unions. You're most welcome and thank you for having me on the show. All right. Well, trade unions play a pivotal role in the protection of workers' rights island-wide. However, these unions should also hold responsibility towards the general public. We leave you tonight with the words of the first Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. Self-respect is what our trade unions have and will give to our workers. That protection for a man's right to his own dignity, his dignity as a human being, as a citizen. He may be an unskilled worker, but he is one of us. That is all we have for you tonight on Law, Land and Liberty. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Thank you for watching. Have a great night.